Uh, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who died recently have had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to talk about insects and arachnids, but before we do, we're going to start out with Admiral Aileen Duerk, who died recently at the age of 98. She was named the first female admiral in the United States Navy in 1972. A couple months back, we did Anna Mae Hayes, who was named the first general in the American Army in 1970. This was a time at which women were starting to get major promotions in the military, and Aileen Duerk was named the first female admiral about a year and a half later. She served in the Pacific at the end of World War II. She then went to Great Lakes here in Chicago, where she did a stint, and she graduated from the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve, one of the best nursing schools in the United States. Here is United News International on the death of Admiral Aileen Dirk. The U.S. Navy's first female admiral, Aileen Dirk, has passed away. Heralded as a trailblazer until the end, the former Rear Admiral died on July 21st at the age of 98. Dirk joined the Nurse Corps in 1941 and served on the hospital ship USS Benevolence during World War II. She rose the ranks and was ultimately appointed as the director of the Navy Nurse Corps in 1970. President Richard Nixon approved Dirk's selection to Rear Admiral in 1972, making her the first woman to be selected for a flag rank. During her storied career, she advocated for women in the military. The Navy Surgeon General Vice Admiral Forrest Faison celebrated Dirk's life after her passing, saying in a statement that she, quote, was a strong and dedicated trailblazer who embodied the very principles that continue to guide Navy medicine today. The University of Central Florida College of Nursing in Orlando erected a bronze statue of Admiral Dirk and has it placed on their campus. We're going to move on to our feature, Charlotte Ray, who died at the age of 92. I love Charlotte Ray, one of the most underrated television comedians ever, and one of the greatest. I would put her right up there with Lucille Ball, Carol Burnett, and Mary Tyler Moore, and she created one of the greatest television characters of all time, which didn't get much attention in the obits. But we'll start with Inside Edition on Charlotte Ray. Charlotte Ray, most famous for her role as Mrs. Garrett, the house mother on The Facts of Life, has died. The Facts of Life, The Facts of Life, The NBC series ran for nine seasons, of which Ray starred on seven of them during the 1980s. Charlotte Ray Lubotsky was born in Milwaukee in 1926. She studied drama at Northwestern University and then moved to New York to pursue an acting career. She starred on Broadway in many shows, including the musical Little Abner. All I remember is going to City Hall and standing in line with you with a piece of paper and then going back to the office without lunch. In the early 70s, she moved to Los Angeles, got married, and had two kids. You said you had one 13-year-old daughter. You didn't say anything about two boys coming to live here. She was soon cast as Mrs. Garrett, first as the housekeeper on Different Strokes. And she said this about the role in an interview with the Television Academy Foundation. I love that woman. She was such a nice lady. She was a good cook. I'm a good cook, not a great cook. She was a good cook. Years later, she co-wrote with her son, Larry, an autobiography called The Facts of My Life. In 2016, she said about her former castmates, I'm still close to the girls. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. Now it's woman to woman, not uh, woman to children. That clip used her greatest role and didn't even mention it, but we'll get back to that. She was one of the first stand-up female comedians on television. Here she's in 1954. It all started when I was just a child. I developed a terrible, terrible habit. Eating. I don't mean eating. I mean eating. One morning at breakfast, I was reaching for my usual piece of lemon chiffon pie when Mummy said with her usual sweetness and tact, Stop, stop, and you must. Fatso! <laughs> fatso! Mom called me Fatso! I vowed then and there I'd never, never touch another sweet. At home. <laughs> the real beginning of it all. The sneaking around with Big Newtons. The secret fun I had with Nabisco wafers. The rendezvous with pistachio ice cream. I didn't get ice cream at home. I didn't mind. I knew a man on the block who pushed the stuff. He knew but me and the bathroom scale. When I was 22, though, I finally began to feel maybe something was wrong. All my friends were getting married or having glamorous careers for themselves. I lumbered on. <laughs> I felt even more certain something was wrong the time my childhood friend came home from Memphis. Instead of saying, honey, is that you all? She said, honey, is that all you? 
Well, that great character I was talking about that they ignored was Sylvia Schnauzer, the wife of Leo Schnauzer, or Al Lewis on Car 54, Where Are You? An absolutely hilarious character. Here, at the end of her life, she talks about the creation of Sylvia Schnauzer and how they should have had a series for her, but the creator, Nat Hyken, died of stress, probably mostly from Joey Ross. Al Lewis needed a wife. He said that the first episode will be that Every Thursday night, we drive the other officers crazy because we're always arguing, arguing, arguing. So they try to skip Thursday night and say it's Friday. And Al Lewis and I had to really know how to argue with each other. So I rented uh, the studio of my acting teacher in New York, Mary Tarsai. And we went in there and started stabbing at each other. And at the end of the hour, we were really battling. So we were ready for the fighting and everything. And, and we did it all the time. And then, you know, Al and I, he, he thought we were very good. And he said that he would like to do a series for us. But Nat died. He died at, at 54. He smoked too many cigarettes and too much aggravation, I guess. Here is some of that arguing in the inaugural Car 54 episode with Sylvia Schnauzer. Hello, Sylvia. Hello, Francis. Hello, Gunther. Well, are you happy? Are you happy? You disgraced us again in front of all the neighbors. I disgraced. If you hadn't started with that big mouth of yours, Leo. look what I'm calling a mouth. That's a burglar alarm with two. You see, you see, with his yelling and his screaming, and all I've been trying to do is say two words to him all night. Drop dead! Show me how, please. Quiet, the both of you. I'm sorry, Leo. When is this going to end? When? When I can walk into this house on a Thursday night, ask an intelligent question, and not get a stupid answer. <laughs> Holy. Now, what caused the argument this Thursday night? What caused it? I'll tell you what caused it. She said that Gene Kelly was a better dancer than Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire can't carry Gene Kelly's tap shoes. How can you talk to a woman like this, Leo? Fred Astaire has got class. <laughs> Gene Kelly, I wouldn't walk around the corner to watch him play hopscotch. Knock it off, please. Okay. Well, at least their arguments are getting topical. Last night, I think it all started. One of them said that James Polk was a lousy president. James Polk was a lousy president. James Polk was a great president. <laughs> you know what the trouble with you is? You still got that stupid schoolgirl crush on Thomas Jefferson because of his powdered wig. Well, let me tell you something. Thomas Jefferson, you snuff. He did not. He did too. He did not. That would have been a great television series. Well, I said we were going to talk about insects and arachnids, so let's start with insects and Lincoln Brower, who died recently at the age of 86, one of the world's experts on the monarch butterfly and the migration pattern of the monarch butterfly, one of the miracles of biology. Every year in the spring and summer, monarchs migrate from the upper Midwest of the United States to a small forested area on the side of a mountain in Michoacan in Mexico, the southwest corner of Mexico. And this migration pattern wasn't established until the 1970s, and Lincoln Brower was one of the people who established it, and here he talks about it. Monarch butterflies have been known to migrate south in the fall but it was, was not until 1975 that they were discovered overwintering in Mexico. Nobody knew where these literally hundreds of millions of monarch butterflies were migrating out of the eastern United States. Here we have an insect. Some of them are born in Nebraska. Some of them are born, most of them are born across the Great Lakes region, but all the way to Maine and all the way south of Virginia. And by the end of the summer, there are tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of monarch butterflies now that are going to leave the northern temperate zone, they're going to leave this breeding habitat, and they're going, just like birds, they're going to fly south up to 2,000 miles to this tiny pinpoint in Mexico. And then, remarkably, these butterflies spend five months hanging in these beautiful Oya Mill fir trees in Mexico, and then at the end of March, they become exceedingly active, they start mating with each other, and then they fly all the way back to the Gulf Coast states. They fly up through Texas, some of them get all the way to northern Florida. And the milkweed plants now are coming out, and the monarch females find these plants and lay their eggs on the plants. And this new generation of monarchs works its way up to the Great Lakes region. Now, what is perhaps even more remarkable than that is that over the summer, three or four generations of butterflies are produced. In the fall, the great-grandchildren 
fly back to these exact same forests in Mexico. They've never seen them before. It skipped several generations. So somehow this ability to find their way to these wonderful overwintering forests in Mexico is a genetically controlled inherited behavior pattern. January 1977 was one of the most exciting moments in my entire life because it was the first time that I walked into a monarch butterfly overwintering grove in Mexico and I realized that this had to be one of the most remarkable biological phenomena in the whole world and it changed my life. You've also worked with the local Mexican population there to preserve those forests that have been compromised by illegal cutdowns at $300 a tree. I find them so beautiful, not only from the, just the spectacle and their own intrinsic beauty and the wonder of metamorphosis, but the many, many dimensions of science that these animals are integrating and the complexity and the evolutionary adaptations that they have. Are, are just fantastic. People frequently ask me, well, wh how, why is the monarch butterfly important? And I answer that question by throwing up a slide of the Mona Lisa and asking, well, why is the Mona Lisa important? Why is Chartres Cathedral important? We're going to close tonight with arachnids and Steve Ditko, who died recently at the age of 90. Steve Ditko was a shy, introverted guy, sort of idiosyncratic, but he was the co-creator of Spider-Man for Marvel Comics. Here's Julian Warker of the BBC Four Last Word on Steve Ditko. Steve Ditko was an American artist and writer whose work at Marvel Comics helped create two of their most memorable characters, the surreal and psychedelic hero Doctor Strange and the costume, the web shooters, the red and blue design that all came together to form Spider-Man. Spider-Man has become one of the most popular and commercially successful superheroes in the world. As Marvel's flagship character, he's appeared in newspaper comic strips, on television and in a series of films. The writer and critic Michael Carlson pays tribute to his co-creator. When Marvel sparked a new golden age for comic books in the 60s, three men were at its heart. Editor and writer Stan Lee had a vision to reach beyond the audience of 12-year-olds. And artists Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko brought Marvel's most famous characters to life. Lee had the notion of a superhero with spider powers and passed the thought on to Kirby. He didn't like Kirby's concept and turned it over to Ditko. Ditko came up with the costume, powers, and most crucially, the teenaged Peter Parker. It was a stroke of genius, and Ditko was the perfect artist to draw Parker, the outcast, bullied high schooler transformed into superhero. Spider-Man debuted in 1962. The next year, Ditko created Doctor Strange. Ken Kesey and the Grateful Dead were reading Doctor Strange as they took acid. We budding teenaged hippies at the time felt Ditko must be one of us. The odd thing was, he wasn't. He left Marvel abruptly in 1966. There were creative differences with Lee. He rankled when Stan added dialogue balloons that changed Spider-Man's disapproval of war protests to support. But it was more a clash of personality, described by comics writer Neil Gaiman as swinging Stan versus the impossibly uptight Ditko. Lee and the rest of the Marvel bullpen were famously self-promoting, yet Ditko would not even let his voice be used on a record made for Marvel fans. Journalists famously sought him out. One staked out the stairwell to his office for two days, and when the door finally opened, he said, Mr. Ditko, and the door promptly slammed back into his face. We critics are sometimes accused of overpraising the hacks who churned out the popular culture of our youths. Perhaps. But Steve Ditko was not only an artist who brought a rare expressionist sensibility to comics, he was a key part in the creation of a new form of entertainment that was to us much more compelling and certainly as adult, as the sitcoms, shoot 'em ups and soap operas the mainstream was offering. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And as a final tribute to Steve Ditko, we're going to close tonight with the Spider-Man theme. But not anything from the movies, but one from the Saturday morning television cartoon show of the late 1960s which I think is a far superior theme. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web, any size, catches seeds, just like flies. Look out, here comes a Spider-Man. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Welcome, fame, he's ignored. Action is his report to him. Life is a great big pain, wherever there's a pain. You'll find a spider man.